the thing that has given Robert Sklar's text such great staying power, and it's really shaped the way historians have treated movies and, and the rise of Hollywood ever since, the thing that gives, its great, gives it this great staying power is his treatment of it as a mass medium of cultural communication. Not just an interesting industry, not just an element of the consumer culture, but this powerful means of communication. Film was a powerful means of communication. Now, this isn't so much Sklar, but others, uh, including myself, I've written a little bit about the history of movies. Others have come along and emphasized even more that we need to look at the early movie theaters as a crucial public space and potentially a civic center in every city neighborhood, in, in cities in which these didn't exist. And a really empowering popular culture. You see at the bottom there, the nation editorialized in 1913 that the crowds, and these are working class, inner city immigrant crowds, the crowds not, not only throng the shows, they talk about them on the street corners in the cars and over the hoods of baby carriages and had a tremendous understanding about how films were made and a certain visual acuity in looking at them and dissecting them. Many people called the early Nickelodeons the Academy of the Working Man, which I think is spot on, except that we have to add women as well. Scholars have shown how women used them as a place for socializing, flirtation. Even married women used them as something of an informal daycare center. These were active, politicized spaces, not the silence theater in the dark, everyone shushing you to be quiet, uh, but lots of talking and, dis and discussing spielers at the front of the uh, at the front of the film, uh, reading out, translating the title cards, music, uh, special effects, uh, um, uh, machines creating uh, special effects during real changes, political groups coming to the front and passing the hat or making one pitch or another. These were very politicized spaces. And please note here on this image, the, uh, the sign that says new ideas, a mass medium of cultural communication. Sklar says on 32, he writes on 32, that not since the Elizabethan age in England had the high culture of the middle and upper classes been a truly popular culture accessible to all social groups. And as powerful as I think Sklar's argument is, I want to take some exception to that in a way that I think just oh, emphasizes even more the importance of what he's doing. Because I think that uh, that there had been a mixing of high and popular culture in the United States in the first half of the 19th century. Indeed, I think this is one of the things that makes me so excited about American history, makes me proud to be an American, that one crucial aspect of democracy in the United States in the 19th century was precisely a cultural democracy, at least at, least at its best. I'm, I'm not ignoring uh, uh, gender inequality, slavery, racism, and, and the like, but at its best, there was this shared public culture that was accessible to all people. And the, the images here are, are meant to try to suggest that. On the upper right is Cooper Union, a free university in New York City, started by a self-described mechanic for the, other, for the education of other mechanics. On the lower left is the U.S. Magazine and Democratic Review. This was started by a small d Democrat to bring the best ideas, the most important ideas, to a popular audience. And all the famous writers that you would be familiar with, Walt Whitman, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Herman Melville, Henry David Thoreau, and so on, all wrote for the Democratic Review. Perhaps the most telling one there is the bottom right, which is a political cartoon from the era of Reconstruction. I won't take the time to explain it exactly to you, but it's addressed to a popular audience and is assuming that people are familiar enough with Shakespeare, the, the piece is a play on Othello, that people are familiar enough with the plays of Shakespeare, and particularly with Othello, that they would understand this um, satiric comment on the relationship between the president, Andrew Johnson, and the former black soldiers of the of the Union Army. And, and then on the upper left, the, the, the hammer uh, point is just to emphasize that this was an aspect of American democracy, this cultural democracy. Just to amplify that a bit, there was a tremendous and fruitful intersection between popular and political cultures in the 19th century. Politics served as entertainment, and entertainment had, had political implications. 
the participation of people in one reinforced the participation in the other. If people were assumed to be competent culturally, there was a natural association that they were competent politically. And the images here on the top left is a popular entertainment, Niblo's Theater, some sort of a musical a comedy. On the upper right is Cooper Union, one of the most important, uh, well, you saw per, uh, Cooper Union before. This is the Great Hall at Cooper Union, um, one of the most important places for public meetings in, in, in the city at the time. On the lower left is a great popular favorite of American theater-going audiences, Edwin Forrest, great popular actor. Uh, on the right is a politician. Mike Walsh, uh, Bowery boy, uh, Lower East Side politician from New York City. And the point is to, to, is to look at the similarity of the venues above top left and top right and the similarity of the styles of uh, communication, lower left, lower right. This intersection of popular and political cultures, this shared public culture. There was an event in, 19, in 1849, the Astor Place Riot, that gives us a sense of what's at stake in these cultural issues. I'll try to be efficient here, but a group of wealthy New Yorkers, tired of mixing it up with the lower classes in the popular theaters of the day, put together a private subscription to build this wonderful theater here, the Astor Place Riot. But then, uh, the, sorry, the Astor Place Theater. But then they established a dress code to exclude the lower classes. You had to have a certain type of a waistcoat, white kid gloves, etc., to enter into the theater. When the theater first opened, it was going to feature this great English actor who was not at all a favorite of the lower class audiences in New York City. They saw him as an aristocrat who was, and he was in fact disdainful of American popular audiences. He was the great antagonist of Edwin Forrest, the man that we saw on the last slide. And a, a crowd of working class artisans and mechanics outside the theater and some inside the theater disrupted McReady's uh, performance and, and would not allow it to go on. The elites who had built the theater decided this can't, we can't let this stand. And they, they uh, convinced McReady to stay for another several days. And they had the militia come out to protect the theater. And McReady was on the stage doing, I, I, I think he was doing Macbeth, if I recall, and Forrest is down in a Bowery theater at the same time performing the same play. But it would became, when it became clear that uh, McReady was going to be allowed to go forward, the crowd outside began to storm the, uh, storm the theater to try to bring it to a, to a stop. And the militia fired on them. This was the first time that an American militia had fired point blank into an American crowd, killing several people. So I think the way to look at this is to say that working class people were saying, wait a minute to the elite, wait a minute, you're not going to go inside this inclusive, exclusive setting and decide what's right and proper and beautiful and dignified and, uh, and so on. You're going to stay out here in the streets the way we've had it before with this intermixing of popular and high cultures. We don't want you receding so that culture was itself a, a, a important power. So this next image then is a uh, just a few years, well, two decades later, 20 years later, at the same theater. And I think it's a beautiful picture that really captures what, what's at stake here again. You see that the, the poor, you, do you see them in the image? You have to hunt for them. They're on the lower left, on the far left-hand side, holding out their hands for charity. No longer full participants in uh, this society, but literally marginalized. And on the right, the, the policeman and the, the top-hatted burger there and, and, and the liveried servant on the extreme right are these, these images of order and authority looming over the scene. So what was happening here in, from the 1840s to the 1860s in New York City happened nationally in the last decades of the 19th century, and that is the emergence of a cultural hierarchy, an assumption that the masses had their own degraded forms of culture and the elite had their own exclusive, high-minded forms of, of, uh, of culture. So on the upper left is the opening reception at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the imposing facade of the Met there on the lower left, uh, you can see there. 
for a long time, the Metropolitan Museum refused to open on Sunday, which was really the only day working people might visit. When the museum finally relented in 1891, the staff prepared for a crowd of 12,000, while the New York Times warned that the Kodak camera fiends should be denied at, uh, admission. All the patrons would have to check canes and umbrellas so that no chance should be given for anyone to prod a hole through a valuable painting. I mean, why would you assume that working, plan, working class people were going to come in the museum and poke a hole through a valuable painting? Well, the assumption was that these cultural forms were beyond their capacity to appreciate and understand. The lower right really brings that home, literally this notion of highbrow Shakespeare uh, epitomizing the Anglo-Saxon refined intelligence that we associate, that they associated with opera, symphonic music, legitimate drama. And then on the right, the low sloping forehead of the lower classes, the immigrant groups, the despised racial groups, and so on. So this cultural hierarchy is emerging here, destroying this shared public culture, this democratic culture, emer uh, emerging here at, at the end of the 19th century in these exclusive setting, these imposing facades, and these cultural assumptions about what people can and cannot appreciate. So I think that's the context in which to think about the rise of movies, and particularly to think about an artist like Chaplin, who was, it, 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 that's the point, who was undeniably an artist, made claim to being, for, for doing art, for doing some form of high culture, and yet he was clearly a man of the people, a man who tried to communicate to the people. So as Scalar puts it, the movies were not simply gathering places where, according to some reformers, sins were committed. They were centers of communication and cultural diffusion. What was most galling, he goes on, to many in the well-to-do city districts, suburbs, and small towns was the idea that working men and immigrants had found their own source of entertainment and information, a source unsupervised and unapproved by the churches and schools, the critics and professors who served as caretakers and disseminators of the official American culture. In, in, in other words, at, 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 I don't know whether to say best or worst, but at worst, what the movies did was challenged that cultural hierarchy and said that working people have, a, have an opportunity to say what is right and true and beautiful and just and proper and so on. At best, there was the possibility of recreating this shared popular culture, recreating this intersection between political and, and, and popular cultures and revitalizing American democracy. The crucial point being that Chaplin is offering offering a view from the bottom. I mean, just think about the film. I, I, I assume you've seen the film at this point. Think about the film, Easy Street, which is obviously meant, ironically, that it isn't easy being poor. And these are the conditions that working people have to deal with. And they want to have a decent life as much as anybody else does. It was a very different view of the industrial city than uh, a, a a high culture, uh, an elite culture would have given us. And then, if you, again, if you've seen the film, I think it's, it, I'd like to ask you to consider, is it just a funny little comedy? Or are there really actually quite serious issues of the day that are being raised in the film? Now, you know, maybe I see more, maybe I see too much in the film, maybe I see things that would be hard for you to see. But from the very beginning, uh, with the Protestant minister droning on in the front of the congregation and in, in the mission house, it raises the issue of Protestant reformers in a Catholic city, you know, these Catholic immigrants, Catholic and Jewish immigrants being communicated to by someone who doesn't even share their religion. But then it goes on to raise all these other issues about poverty, homelessness, alcoholism, charity, organized charity, friendly visiting, which was a sort of a form of, of organized charity where the woman would come in and, and, and pretend to be your friend just on a friendly visit, but would be taking notes to determine whether you were worthy of getting charity or not. Goes on to deal with issues of violence, repression, pr police brutality, the need for, for repression. You know, not only not only the horror of repression, but but about, but 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 to 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 really raise interesting questions about well, yeah, but don't we need repression as well when there's the bullies uh, in in the upper right hand corner? What do we do about them? 
And then issues of unwed, unwed mothers, birth control, domestic violence, drug use, the white slave trade, which was a particular obsession in these uh, early 20th century cities, the notion that good, decent white girls from the uh, countryside were being abducted and, and taken into prostitution. If you remember that scene at the very end when the, the group, the group uh, they, they, they grab the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the charity lady and drag her off. Uh, personal reform, uh, the, just simply the story of Charlie Chaplin, what happens to him in the story. How, how much do we need, how much can we rely on personal forms of reform? How much do we need more broadly civic forms of renewal? Uh, rape, uh, uh, cultural uplift, uh, so, so on. Um, so this is, to me, not just a funny little film, but can be seen as part of a civic culture. It's not alone in this as well. Uh, the image here is of um, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. This is the, the, the main, neither one of these images are a movie image. These are actually documentary images. That There was a fire at the top of a 12-story, uh, 13-story uh, uh, factory. The, the fire doors had been padlocked. As you can see on the left, there was one lousy little fire escape with this rickety ladder. Uh, dozens and dozens of women, as the fire spread, had to jump from the 13th floor to their deaths on the street. My point here is that at least two films were made, films from contrasting points of view were made to deal with this pressing public issue. Manufacturers made a film about it to, to justify their own position, uh, but organized labor made another film. So there, there's this really interesting civic argument and debate uh, going on. I'll just be really quick about this, but there's this infamous Ludlow Massacre out in Colorado, and at least three films were made of this. Um, there's a long quote here at the top of the slide. You can see uh, a, a quote from, from uh, Stephen Ross's uh, tremendous book called Working Class Hollywood, where he's talking about the diversity of producers in this period. There really is no Hollywood, no dominant set of movie producers, uh, but all sorts of people are making films from all sorts of different perspectives. Which, which is why someone like J uh, John Collier, a civic reformer in New York City, could look at the movies and say, really what we need to think about these the movie theaters is not as simply a commercial plaything, not just a market entity that should be exploited for private and personal profit, but we need to look at this this powerful means of communication, again, Ross, a mass medium of cultural communication. We need to look at this as, a, as an adjunct to our civic culture, as a means of revitalizing our democracy. And so reformers like John Collier said, cities should provide municipal theaters where, where, um, where all comers could, could, could display their films. And some people, some of these reformers wanted to attach discussion rooms and even branches of the public library to these small little theaters as a way to engage people in an issue, encourage them to discuss it, and then even, even research into it and look in, into it somewhat more. So I think Chaplin is is really part of that whole ferment there as well. Uh, not to deny he wasn't. He was obviously fabulously successful as a commercial artist, but I think there's something more going on there. So um, this is kind of a big piece here, but um, I guess two things, two quick things. One, one is that... Um, you can see here in the progressive era that many reformers are asking, as work becomes more routinized, as people don't throw themselves completely into their work and kind of just get, you know, are mindless uh, uh, workers on an assembly line or just pushing papers or something, what's going to shape our character when work no longer shapes our character? So people began to think more about leisure, leisure time activities as something that would shape proper character. And some people even looked at the movies as, I mean, that's there's Collier, right? Uh, the, those civic reformers who are saying this is a civic institution. We need to think about it as as, as part of our democracy. Other forms of this are on the, on the lower right. You see this this organized play movement, and I'm not sure you can read the sign on the basketball hoop there, but it says playground open to all children when play leaders are present. So there was also this sort of manipulative element that, well, we have to direct play and so on. 
But I think in some ways, uh, Chaplin captures that with that wonderful, and this is the second point, in some ways, Ka uh, 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 Chaplin uh, captures this new interest in leisure as a way of molding character in that wonderful title card at the very end of the film where, you know, the easy street has been reformed and everything is nice. We have the new mission and so on. Force backed by love, forgiveness sweet, brings hope and peace to easy street. Um, force backed by love, you know, so force was the old way, but wait a minute, let's think about, aren't there other ways to make people good? They can't love do that as much as possible. And, oh, by the way, incidentally, those, what are they, six, eight, 12, a dozen words there, pulling in immigrant audiences, you know, you just see 12 words, it's almost an invitation to a language lesson, an invitation to learning the language. Um, and then, this is the last slide, but I've always looked at the end of the film and looked at the new mission, the reformed mission, and thought, damn, that looks a hell of a lot like a Nickelodeon. And so I, I, I'm not necessarily saying that Chaplin set out consciously to say, oh, well, let me make a film where we look at the Nickelodeon and this new leisure realm as a way of creating a new civic culture and bringing better conditions to the inner city. He doesn't need to have been thinking about it consciously. It's a, a, art is very often unconscious. It's 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 it's, it's dreamlike. I mean, we don't we don't plan out our dreams, but our dreams can be uh, particularly inviting. Uh, not only, uh, not, not so much inviting, I mean, uh, our dreams can be revealing, right? Um, and so I'm juxtaposing the, uh, the image of the new mission here with some other images of uh, lower right, the kids uh, in the back of the Nickelodeon. The upper right, it just, that's the one that's always struck me as so similar. And then a couple of other types of Nickelodeons on, uh, uh, there on the left. So thanks for sticking with me. I hope this gives you some, uh, some uh, assistance as you write that short essay uh, on the significance of uh, Chaplin's films. Thank you.